Hello and welcome to the first course in the data science specialization series using R programming which is all about the some key concepts in the data science and please subscribe to our channel if you haven't subscribed yet. Get ready to dive deep into what is data science whether you are a seasoned pro or just starting out. We have got something for everyone from the basics to the cutting edge we will explore what is data science from every angle. So um, buckle up grab your favorite beverage and let's jump right in. Together we will unlock the secrets of data science and have a blast along the way. Let's go. So the first question uh, you probably need answered going into this course is what is data science? And that is a great question. To different people this means different things. But at its core data science is using data to answer questions. This is a pretty broad definition. And that's because it's a pretty broad field. Data science can involve statistics, computer science, mathematics, data cleaning and formatting, data visualization. An economist uh, special report sums up this combination of skills well. They state that a data scientist is broadly defined as someone who combines the skills of software programmer, statistician and a storyteller slash artist to extract the nuggets of gold hidden under mountains of data. And by the end of these courses, uh, hopefully you will feel equipped to do just that. So one of the reasons for the rise of data science in recent year is the vast amount of data currently available and being generated. Not only uh, are massive amounts of data being collected about uh, many aspects of the world and our lives, but we simultaneously have the rise of inexpensive computing. This has created the perfect storm in which we have rich data and the tools to analyze it. Rising computer memory, capabilities, better processors, more softwares and now more data scientists with the skills to put this to use and answer questions using this data. There is a little uh, anecdote that describes the truly exponential growth of data generation we are experiencing. In the 3rd century BC, the library of Alexandria was believed to house the sum of human knowledge. Today there is enough information in the world to give every person alive 320 times as much of it as uh, historians think was stored in Alexandria's entire collection. And uh, that is still growing. We will talk a little bit more about uh, big data in a later lecture. But it uh, deserves an introduction here. Since uh, it has been so integral uh, to the rise of data science, there are a few qualities that characterize big data. The first is volume. As the name implies, big data involves large data sets and these large data sets are becoming more and more routine. For example, say you had a question about uh, online video. Well, YouTube has approximately 300 hours of uh, video uploaded every minute. You would definitely have a lot of data available to you to analyze. But uh, you can see how this might be a difficult problem to wrangle all of the data. And this brings us to the second quality of big data, that is its velocity. Data is being generated and collected faster than ever before. In our YouTube example, new data is coming at you every minute. In a completely different example, say uh, you have a question about shipping times or routes. Well, uh, most uh, transport trucks have real-time GPS data available. So you could, uh, in real time, analyze the truck's movements if uh, you have the tools and skills to do so. The third quality of big data is variety. In the examples I have mentioned uh, so far, you have different types of data available to you. In the YouTube example, uh, you could be analyzing video or audio, which is, a, which is a very unstructured data set. Or you could have a database of video lengths, views or comments which is a much more structured data set to analyze. So that was our summary of three qualities that characterize big data. So we have talked about uh, what data science is and what sorts of data it deals with. But something else uh, we need to discuss is uh, what exactly a data scientist is. The most basic uh, of definitions would be that a data scientist is somebody uh, who uses data to answer questions. But more importantly to you, what skills does a data scientist embody? And to answer this, uh, uh, we have this illustrative Venn diagram of Drew Conway, in which uh, data science is the intersection of three sectors. 
substantive expertise, hacking skills, and math and statistics. To explain a little on what we mean by this, we know that we use data science to answer questions. So first, we need to have enough expertise in the area that we want to ask about in order to formulate our questions and to know what sorts of data are appropriate to answer that question. Once we have our question and appropriate data, we know from the source of data that uh, data science works with. Oftentimes, it needs uh, to undergo significant cleaning and formatting. And this often takes computer programming slash hacking skills. Finally, once we have our data, we need to analyze it. And this often takes math and stats knowledge. In this specialization, we will spend a bit of time focusing on each of these three sectors but will primarily focus on math and statistics knowledge and hacking skills. For hacking skills, we will focus on teaching uh, two different components, computer programming or at least computer programming with R, which uh, will allow you to assess data, play around with it, analyze it and plot it. Additionally, we will focus on having you learn how to go out and get answers to your programming questions. One reason data scientists are in such demands is that uh, most of the answers are not already outlined in textbooks. A data scientist needs to be somebody who knows how to find answers to novel problems. Speaking of that demand, there is a huge need for individuals with data science skills. Not only are machine learning engineers, data scientists and big data engineers among the top emerging jobs, the demand far exceeds the supply. Data scientist roles have grown exponentially since 2012, but currently demand beats the supply significantly around the world. Besides, hundreds of companies are hiring for those roles, even those you may not expect in sectors like retail and finance. Supply of candidates for these roles cannot keep up with demand. This is a great time to be getting into data science. Not only do we have more and more data, and more and more tools for collecting, storing and analyzing it. But the demand of data scientists is becoming increasingly recognized as important in many diverse sectors, not just business and academia. Additionally, according to Towards Data Science, in which they rank the top 50 best jobs in America, data scientist is the top job in the US in 2022 based on job satisfaction, salary and demand. The diversity of sectors in which data science is being used is exemplified by looking at examples of data scientists. One place we might not immediately recognize the demand for data science is in sports. Darren Morey is the general manager of the US basketball team, the Houston Rockets. Despite not having a strong background in basketball, Morey was awarded the job as general manager on the basis of his bachelor's degree in computer science and his MBA from MIT. He was chosen for his ability to collect and analyze data and use that to make informed hiring decisions. Another data scientist that you have heard of is Hilary Mason. She is a co-founder of Fast Forward Labs, a machine learning company recently acquired by Cloudera, a data science company and is a data scientist in residence at SL. Broadly, she uses data to answer questions about mining the web and understanding the way that humans interact with each other through social media. And finally, Ned Silver is one of the most famous data scientists or statisticians in the world today. He is a founder and editor-in-chief at 538, a website that uses uh, statistical analysis, hard numbers to tell uh, compelling stories about elections, politics, sports, science, economics, and lifestyle. He uses large amounts of mm, totally free public data to make predictions about a variety of topics. Most notably, he makes predictions about who will win elections in the US and has a remarkable track record for accuracy doing so. One example of data science in action is the development of personalized recommendations on streaming platforms like Netflix or Spotify. These companies use data science techniques to analyze user behavior, such as the content they watch or listen to, how long they watch or listen to it, and which other users have similar preferences. Based on this analysis, the platform can generate personalized recommendations for each user, suggesting new content that uh, they are likely to enjoy. The recommendations are constantly updated as the platform gathers more data on each user's preferences and behavior. This application of data science not only improves the user experience, 
but also helps the company increase user engagement and retention leading to higher revenue and profitability so our last question is what will we teach you in this course now that you have had this introduction into data science all that uh, really remains to cover here is a summary of what it is that we will be teaching you throughout this course to start we will go over the basics of r r is the main programming language that we will be working with in this course track so a solid understanding of what it is how it works and getting it installed on your computer is a must we will then uh, transition into r studio which is a very nice graphical interface to r that should make your life easier we will then talk about version control why it is important and how to integrate it into your work and once uh, you have all of these basics down you will be all set to apply these tools to answering your very own data science questions if you haven't subscribed to this channel please subscribe now since we have uh, spent some time discussing what data science is we should spend some time looking at what exactly data is first let's look at what a few trusted sources consider data to be first up we will look at uh, the cambridge english dictionary which uh, states that data is information especially facts or numbers collected to be examined and considered and used to help decision making second we will look at the definition provided by wikipedia which is a set of values of qualitative or quantitative variables these uh, two are slightly different definitions and they get at different components of what data is both agree that data is values or numbers or facts but the cambridge definition focuses on the actions that surround data data is collected examined and most importantly used to inform decisions we have focused on this aspect before we have talked about how the most important part of data science is the question and how all we are doing uh, is using the, the data to answer the question the cambridge definition focuses on this the wikipedia de definition focuses more on what data entails and although it is a, a fairly short definition we will take a second to parse this and focus on each component individually so the first thing uh, to focus on is a, is a set of values to have data you need a set of items to measure from in statistics uh, this set of items is often called uh, the population the set as a whole is what you are trying to discover something about for example that set of items required to answer your question might be all websites or it might be uh, the set of all people coming to websites or it might be a set of all people getting a particular drug but in general it's a set of things that you are going to make measurements on the next thing to focus on is variables variables uh, are measurements or characteristics of an item for example you could be measuring the height of a person or you are measuring the amount of time a person stays on a website on the other hand it might be a more qualitative characteristic you are trying to measure like uh, what a person clicks on on a website or uh, uh, whether you think the person visiting is male or female finally we have both qualitative and quantitative variables qualitative variables are unsurprisingly information about qualities they are things like uh, country of origin sex or treatment group they are usually described by words not numbers and they are not necessarily ordered quantitative variables on the other hand are information about quantities quantitative measurements are usually described by numbers and are measured on a continuous ordered scale they are things like height weight and blood pressure so uh, taking this whole definition into consideration we have measurements either qualitative or quantitative on a set of items making up data not a bad definition huh when we were uh, going over the definitions our examples of variables and measurements country of origin sex height weight are pretty basic examples you can easily envision them in a nice looking spreadsheet with individuals along one side of the table and the information for those variables along the other side 
Unfortunately, this is rarely how data is presented to you. The data sets we commonly encounter are much messier and it is our job to extract the information we want, correlate into something tidy like uh, the imagined table here and analyze it appropriately and often visualize our results. Here are just uh, some of the data sources you might encounter and we will briefly look at what a few of these data sets often look like or how uh, they can be interpreted. But one thing they have in common is the messiness of the data. You have to work to extract the information you need to answer your question. Sequencing data, population census data, electronic medical records, geographic information system, image analysis and image extrapolation, language and translations, website traffic, personal or ad data, for example, Facebook or Netflix predictions, etc. So um, one type of data that I work with uh, regularly is sequencing data. This data is generally first encountered in the uh, fast queue format. The raw file format produced by sequencing machines. These files are often hundreds of millions of lines long and it is our job to parse this into an un understandable and interpretable format and uh, infer something about the individual's genome. In this case, this data was interpreted into expression data and produced a plot called a volcano plot. A, vol a volcano plot is produced uh, uh, at the end of a long process to wrangle the raw fast cube data into interpretable expression data. One rich source of information is countrywide censuses. In these, almost all members of a country answer a set of standardized uh, questions and submit these answers to the government. When you have that many respondents, the data is large and messy. But once this large database is ready to be queried, the answers embedded are important. Here we have a very basic uh, result of the last US census in which uh, all respondents are divided by sex and age. And this uh, distribution is plotted in this uh, population pyramid plot. Link to the US census website and some tools to help you examine it will be provided in the blog post for you. But if you are not from the US, I urge you to check out your home country's census bureau if available and look at some of the data there. Electronic medical records are in increasingly uh, prevalent as a way to store health information and more and more population based studies are using this data to answer questions and make uh, inferences about populations at large or as a method to identify ways to improve medical care. For example, if you are asking about a population's uh, common allergies, you will have to extract many individuals allergy uh, information and put that into a easily interpretable table format where you will then perform your analysis. A more complex uh, data source to analyze are images or videos. There is a wealth of information coded in an image or video and it is just waiting to be extracted. An example of image analysis that you may be familiar with is when you upload a picture to Facebook and, uh, and not only does it automatically recognize faces in the picture but then suggest uh, who they may be. A fun example you can play with is the uh, Deep Dream software that was originally designed to detect faces in an image but has since moved to more artistic pursuits. In this lesson, we are going to be a little more conceptual and look at some of the types of analysis data scientists employ to answer questions in data science. There are broadly speaking six categories in which data analysis fall. In the approximate order of difficulty, they are descriptive, exploratory, inferential, predictive, causal and mechanistic analysis. Let's explore the goals of each of these types and look at some examples of each analysis. The goal of descriptive analysis is to describe or summarize a set of data. Whenever you get a new data set to examine, this is usually the first kind of analysis you will perform. Descriptive analysis will generate simple summaries about the samples and their measurements. You may be familiar with common descriptive statistics, measures of central tendency such as mean, median or mode or measures of variability such as range, standard deviations or variance. 
This type of analysis is aimed at summarizing your sample, not for generalizing the results of the analysis to a larger population or trying to make conclusions. Description of data is separated from making interpretations. Generalizations and interpretations require additional statistical steps. Some examples of purely descriptive analysis can be seen in censuses. Here the government collects a series of measurements on all of the country's citizens which can then be summarized. Here you are being shown the age distribution in the US stratified by sex. The goal of this is just to describe the distribution. There is no inferences about what this means or predictions on how the data might trend in the future. It is just to show you a summary of data collected. The goal of exploratory analysis is to examine or explore the data and find relationships that were not pre previously known. Exploratory analysis explore how different measures might be related to each other but do not confirm that relationship as causative. You have probably heard the phrase correlation does not imply causation and exploratory analysis lie at the root of this saying. Just because you observe a relationship between two variables during exploratory analysis, it does not mean that one necessarily causes the other. Because of this, exploratory analysis, while useful for discovering new connections, should not be the final say in answering a question. It can allow you to formulate hypotheses and drive the design of future studies and data collection. But exploratory analysis alone should never be used as the final say on how or why data might be related to each other. Going back to the census example from above, rather than just summarizing the data points within a single variable, we can look at how two or more variables might be related to each other. In this plot, we can see the percent of the workforce that is made up of women in various sectors and how that has changed between 2000 and 2016. Exploring this data, we can see quite a few relationships. Looking just at the top row of the data, we can see that women make up a vast majority of nurses and that it has slightly decreased in 16 years. While these are interesting relationships to note, the causes of these relationships is not apparent from the analysis. All exploratory analysis can tell us is that a relationship exists, not the cause. The goal of inferential analysis is to use a relatively small sample of data to infer or say something about the population at large. Inferential analysis is commonly the goal of statistical modeling where you have a small amount of information to extrapolate and generalize that information to a larger group. Inferential analysis typically involves using the data you have to estimate that value in the population and then give a measure of your uncertainty about your estimate. Since you are moving from a small amount of data and trying to generalize to a larger population, your ability to accurately infer information about the larger population depends heavily on your sampling scheme. If the data you collect is not from a representative sample of the population, the generalizations you infer won't be accurate for the population. Unlike in our previous examples, we shouldn't be using census data in inferential analysis. A census already collected information on functionally the entire population, there is nobody left to infer to and inferring data from the US census to another country would not be a good idea because the US isn't necessarily representative of another country that we are trying to infer knowledge about. Instead, a better example of inferential analysis is a study in which a subset of the US population was assayed for their life expectancy given the level of air pollution they experienced. This study uses the data they collected from a sample of the US population to infer how air pollution might be impacting life expectancy in the entire US. The goal of predictive analysis is to use current data to make predictions about future data. Essentially, you are using current and historical data to find patterns and predict the likelihood of future outcomes. Like in inferential analysis, your accuracy in predictions is dependent on measuring the right variables. If you are not measuring the right variables to predict an outcome, your predictions are not going to be accurate. Additionally, there are many ways to build up prediction models with some being better or worse for specific cases. But in general, having more data and a simple model generally performs well at predicting future outcomes. All this being said, much like in exploratory analysis, just because one variable may predict another, it does not mean that one causes the other. 
you are just capitalizing on this observed relationship to predict the second variable. A common saying is that prediction is hard, especially about the future. There are not easy ways to gauge how well you are going to predict an event until that event has come to pass. So evaluating different approaches or models is a challenge. We spend a lot of time trying to predict things, the upcoming weather, the outcomes of sports events, and in the example we will explore here the outcomes of elections. We have previously mentioned Ned Silver of 538 where they try and predict the outcomes of US elections and sports matches too. Using historical polling data and trends and current polling, 538 builds models to predict the outcomes in the next US presidential vote and has been fairly accurate at doing so. 538's models accurately predicted the 2008 and 2012 elections and was widely considered an outlier in the 2016 US elections as it was one of the few models to suggest Donald Trump at having a chance of winning. The caveat to a lot of analysis we have looked at so far is that we can only see correlations and cannot get at the cause of the relationships we observe. Causal analysis fills that gap. The goal of causal analysis is to see what happens to one variable when we manipulate another variable. Looking at the cause and effect of a relationship. Picture in the slide best explains the causal analysis where we conduct a study to see the side effects of one drug that causes blood pressure and hence medically proved that blood pressure causes heart attacks. So we can say that this drug causes heart attacks. Generally causal analysis are fairly complicated to do with observed data alone. There will always be questions as to whether it is correlation driving your conclusions or that the assumptions underlying your analysis are valid. More often, causal analysis are applied to the results of randomized studies that were designed to identify causation. Causal analysis is often considered the gold standard in data analysis and is seen frequently in scientific studies where scientists are trying to identify the cause of a phenomena but often getting appropriate data for doing a causal analysis is a challenge. One thing to note about causal analysis is that the data is usually analyzed in aggregate and observed relationships are usually average effects. So while on average, giving a certain population a drug may alleviate the symptoms of a disease, this causal relationship may not hold true for every single affected individual. As we have said, many scientific studies allow for causal analysis. Randomized control trials for drugs are a prime example of this. For example, one randomized control trial examined the effects of a new drug on treating infants with spinal muscular atrophy. Comparing a sample of infants receiving the drug versus a sample receiving a mock control, they measure various clinical outcomes in the babies and look at how the drug affects the outcomes. Mechanistic analysis are not nearly as commonly used as the previous analysis. The goal of mechanistic analysis is to understand the exact changes in variables that lead to exact changes in other variables. These analyses are exceedingly hard to use to infer much except in simple situations or in those that are nicely modeled by deterministic equations. Given this description, it might be clear to see how mechanistic analysis are most commonly applied to physical or engineering sciences and biological sciences. For example, are far too noisy of datasets to use mechanistic analysis. Often when these analyses are applied, the only noise in the data is measurement error which can be accounted for. You can generally find examples of mechanistic analysis in material science experiments. Here we have a study on mechanistic analysis of the observed route of oxygen molecule evolution and the formation of one oxygen molecule. They are able to do mechanistic analysis through a careful balance of controlling and manipulating variables with very accurate measures of the variables and the desired outcome. A term you may have heard of before this course is big data. There have always been large data sets, but it seems like lately this has become a buzzword in data science. But what does it mean? As the name suggests, big data are very large data sets. We previously discussed three qualities that are commonly attributed to big data sets, such as volume, velocity, and variety. From these three adjectives, we can see that big data involves large data sets of diverse data types that are being generated very rapidly. So none of these qualities seem particularly new. Then why has the concept of big data been so recently popularized? 
in part as technology and data storage has evolved to be able to hold larger and larger data sets the definition of big has evolved too also our ability to collect and record data has improved with time such that the speed with which data is collected is unprecedented finally what is considered data has evolved so that there is now more than ever companies have recognized the benefits to collecting different sorts of informations and the rise of internet and technology have allowed different and varied data sets to be more easily collected and available for analysis one of the main shifts in data science has been moving from structured data sets to tackling unstructured data structured data is what you traditionally might think of data long tables spreadsheets or databases with columns and rows of information that you can sum or average or analyze however you like within those confines unfortunately this is really how data is presented to you in this day and age the data sets we commonly encounter are much messier and it is our job to extract the information we want and correlate it into something tidy and structured with the digital age and the advance of the internet many pieces of information that were not traditionally collected were suddenly able to be translated into a format that a computer could record store search and analyze and once this was appreciated there was a proliferation of this unstructured data being collected from all of your digital interactions such that emails facebook and other social media interactions text messages shopping habits smartphones and their gps tracking websites you visit how long you are on that website and what you look at cctv cameras and other video sources etc the amount of data and the various sources that can record and transmit data has exploded it is because of this explosion in the volume velocity and variety of data that big data has become so salient a concept these data sets are now so large and complex that we need new tools and approaches to make the most of them as you can guess given the variety of data types and sources very rarely is the data stored in a neat ordered spreadsheet that traditional methods for cleaning and analysis can be applied to given some of the qualities of big data above you can already start seeing some of the challenges that may be associated with working with big data it is big there is a lot of raw data that you need to be able to store and analyze it is constantly changing and updating by the time you finish your analysis there is even more new data you could incorporate into your analysis every second you are analyzing is another second of data you have not used the variety can be overwhelming there are so many sources of information that it can sometimes be difficult to determine what source of data may be best suited to answer your data science question and finally it is messy you don't have neat data tables to quickly analyze you have messy data before you can start looking for answers you need to turn your unstructured data into a format that you can analyze so with all of these changes why don't we just stick to analyzing smaller more manageable curated data sets and arriving at our answers that way sometimes questions are best addressed using these smaller data sets but many questions benefit from having lots and lots of data and if there is some messiness or inaccuracies in this data the sheer volume of it negates the effect of these small errors so we are able to get closer to the truth even with these messy data sets additionally when you have data that is constantly updating while this can be a challenge to analyze the ability to have real time up to date information allows you to do analysis that are accurate to the current state and make on the spot rapid informed predictions and decisions one of the benefits of having all these new sources of information is that questions that were not previously able to be answered due to lack of information suddenly have many more sources to glean information from and new connections and discoveries are now able to be made questions that previously were inaccessible now have newer unconventional data sources that may allow you to answer these formerly unfeasible questions another benefit to using big data is that it can identify hidden correlations since we can collect data on a myriad of qualities on any one subject we can look for qualities that may not be obviously related to our outcome variable but the big data can identify a correlation there instead of trying to understand precisely why an engine breaks down or why a drug's side effect disappears researchers can instead collect and analyze massive quantities of information about such events and everything that is associated with them and looking for patterns that might help predict future occurrences big data helps answer what 
not why and often that's good enough. Big data has now made it possible to collect vast amounts of data very rapidly from a variety of sources and improvements in technology have made it cheaper to collect, store and analyze. But the question remains, how much of this data explosion is useful for answering questions you care about? Regardless of the size of the data, you need the right data to answer a question. A famous statistician John Tucky said in 1986, the combination of some data and an aching desire for an answer does not ensure that a reasonable answer can be extracted from a given body of data. Essentially, any given data set may not be suited for your question, even if you really wanted it to, and big data does not fix this. Even the larger data sets around might not be big enough to be able to answer your question if it's not the right data. One of the main skills you are going to be called upon uh, as for a data scientist is your ability to solve problems and sometimes to do that you need help. The ability to solve problems is at the root of data science so the importance of being able to do so is paramount. In the first lesson we are going to equip you with some strategies to help you when you get stuck with a problem and need some help. Much of this information has been compiled from Roger Pang's video on getting help and Eric Raymond's uh, how to ask questions the smart way. So why is knowing how to get uh, help important? First off, this course is not like a standard class you have taken before where there may be 30 to 100 people and you have access to your professor for immediate help. In this class at any one time there can be thousands of students taking the class. No one person could provide help to all of these people all of the time. So we will introduce you to some strategies to deal with getting help in this course. Also as we said earlier, uh, being able to solve problems is often one of the core skills of a data scientist. Data science is new. You may be the first person to come across a specific problem and you need to be equipped with skills that allow you to tackle problems that are both new to you to you and to your community finally troubleshooting and figuring out solutions to problems is a great transferable skill it will serve you well as a data scientist but so much of what any job often entails is problem solving so uh, being able to think about problems and uh, get help effectively is of benefit to you in whatever career path you find yourself in before you ask for help, uh, before you begin asking others for help on your problems, there are a few steps that you can take on your own. One of your first stops for data analysis problems should be reading the manuals or help files. For our problems, try typing question mark command. If you post a question on a forum that is easily answered by the manual, you will often get a reply of read the manual which is not the easiest way to get at the answer you were going for. Steps are searching on Google and searching relative forums. Common forums for data science problems include Stack Overflow and Cross Validated. Additionally, you can ask questions on our social media platforms or ask in the comments below. I'll try to answer uh, them all, but before asking in comment, don't forget to check if same question has been answered before. While you are googling, things to pay attention to uh, and look for are tutorials, facts or vignettes. Of whatever command or problem is giving you trouble, these are great resources to get you started either in telling you the language or words to use in your next searches or outright showing you how to do something. Uh, as you get further in this course and using R, you may run into coding problems and errors and there are a few strategies you should have ready to deal with these. In my experience coding problems uh, generally fall into two categories. Your command, pro uh, your command produces no data and uh, spits out an error message or your command produces an output but it is not what at all uh, what you wanted. These two problems have different strategies for dealing with them. If it's a problem producing an error message, check for typos. Read the error message and make sure you understand it. 
Google the error message exactly. I have been there. You type out a command and all you get are lines and lines of angry and red text uh, telling you that you did something wrong. And this can be overwhelming but taking a second to check over your command for typos and then carefully reading the error message solves the problem in nearly all of, uh, all of the cases. The error messages are there to help you. It is the computer telling you what went wrong. And when all else fails, you can be pretty assured that somebody out there got the same error message, panicked and posted it to a forum. So the answer is out there. And if you get an output, but it uh, isn't what you expected. Consider how uh, the output was different uh, from what you expected. Think about what it looks like uh, the command actually uh, did, why it would do that and not uh, what you wanted. Most problems like this are because the command uh, you provided told the program to do one thing and it did that thing exactly. It just turns out uh, what you told it to do wasn't actually what you wanted. These problems are often the most frustrating. You are so close but so far. The, the quickest way to figuring out what went wrong is looking out, uh, at the output you did get comparing it to what you wanted and thinking about how the program may have produced uh, that output instead of what you wanted. Uh, these sorts of problems give you plenty of practice thinking like a computer program. Alright, you have done everything you are supposed to do to solve the problem on your own. Now you need to bring in the big guns. It's just uh, is to find a peer with some experience with uh, what you are working on and ask them for help or direction. This is a often um, this is often great because the person explaining gets to solidify their understanding while teaching it to you, and you get a, a hands-on uh, experience seeing how they would solve the problem. In this class, uh, your peers and uh, that can be your classmates and me. And you can interact with them through the uh, comments below. Of course, double check that your question hasn't been uh, asked already. But outside of this course, you may not have uh, too many data science savvy peers. What then? Rubber duck debugging, which is a long held tradition of solitary programmers everywhere. In the book, The uh, Pragmatic Programmer. There's a story of how uh, stumped programmers would explain their problem to a rubber duck and in the process of explaining the problem, they identified the solution. Trust me, this trick really works because I do this a lot. Wikipedia explains it well. Many programmers have had the experience of explaining a programming problem to someone else, possibly even to someone who knows nothing about programming. And then, and, and then hitting upon the solution in the process of explaining the problem and describing what the code is supposed to do and observing what it actually does. Any incongruity uh, between these two becomes apparent. So next time you are stumped, bring out the bath toys. Now you have done your best, you have searched and searched. You have talked with peers, you have done everything possible to figure it out on your own and you are still stuck. It's time, time to post your question to a relative forum. Before you go ahead and just post uh, your question, you need to consider uh, how you can best ask your question to garner helpful answers. Here are the ways uh, how to effectively ask questions on forums and uh, details to include. The question you are trying to answer, how you approach the problem, what steps uh, you have already taken to answer the question. What steps will um, reproduce the problem, including sample data for troubleshooters to work from? What was the expected output? What you saw instead, including any error messages you received? What troubleshooting steps you have already tried? Details about uh, your setup, for example, what operating system you are using, what version of the product you have installed, for example, R, our packages and finally be specific in the title of your question. 
Now, uh, how to title for posts? Most of these details are self-explanatory, uh, but there can be uh, an art to titling your posting. Without being specific, you don't give your potential helpers a lot to go off of. They don't really know uh, what the problem is and whether if they are able to help you. Bad titles would be help, can't find linear model or help, don't understand PCA. These titles don't give your potential helpers a lot to go off of. They don't really know what the problem is and if they are able to help you. Instead, you need to provide some details about what you are having problems with, answering uh, what you were doing and what the problem is. Answering what uh, you were doing and what the problem is are two key pieces of information that you need to provide. This way, somebody who is on the forum will know exactly will know exactly what is happening and that they might be able to help. Better titles uh, would be R3.4.3 LM. Function produces a uh, set fault with large data frame, Windows 10, or uh, applied PCA to a matrix. Uh, what are U, D, and VT? Even better titles would be uh, R3.4.3 LM function on Windows 10, set fault uh, on large data frame, using principal uh, components to discover common variation in rows of a matrix. Should I use U, D or VT? Use titles that focus on very specific to the core problem that you are trying to get help with. It signals to people that uh, you are looking for a very specific answer. The more specific the question, often the faster the answer. So, uh, for etiquettes, Following a lot of the tips above uh, will serve you well in posting on forums and observing forum etiquette. You are asking for help. You are hoping somebody else uh, will, take a, will take time out of their day to help you. You need to be courteous. Often this takes the form of asking specific questions, doing some troubleshooting of your own, and giving potential problem solvers easy access to all the information they need to help you. Formalizing some of these do's and don'ts, uh, you get the following list. Uh, do's are read the forum posting um, guidelines. Make sure you are asking your question on an appropriate forum. Describe the goal. Be explicit and uh, detailed in your explanation. Provide the minimum information required to describe and replicate the problem. Be courteous uh, by adding please and thank you. Follow up on the post or post the solution. Let's take a few seconds to talk a bit about this last point. As we have touched on the others already. First, uh, what do we mean by follow up on the post? Now you have asked your question and you have received several answers and uh, behold one of them works. You are all set, get back to work. No, this isn't the way. Go back to your posting. Reply to the solution what worked for you explaining that they fixed your problem and thanking them for their solution. Not only uh, do the people helping you deserve thanks, but this is helpful to anybody else who has the same problem as you later on. They are going to do uh, their due diligence, search the forum and find your post. It is so helpful for you to have flagged the answer that solved your problem. Conversely, while you are waiting for a reply, perhaps you stumble upon the solution. Don't just close the posting and never check back on it. One, uh, people who are trying to help you may be replying to you and uh, you are uh, functionally and you are functionally ignoring them or uh, two, uh, if you close it with no solution, Somebody with the same problem uh, won't ever learn what your solution was. Make sure to post the solution and uh, thank everybody for their help. Don'ts would look like uh, immediately assume you have found a bug. Post homework questions. Cross post on multiple forums. Repost uh, if you don't immediately get a response. These are all pretty clear guidelines. Nobody wants to help somebody uh, who assumes that 
the root cause of the problem isn't because they have made a mistake but that there is something wrong with the program spoiler alert it's almost uh, always because you made a mistake similarly nobody wants to uh, do your homework for you they want to help somebody who is genuinely trying to help learn not find a, a shortcut additionally for people who are uh, active on multiple forums it is always aggravating when the same person posts the same question on five different forums or when the same question is posted on the same forum repeatedly be patient pick the most relevant forum for your purposes post once and wait In this lesson we are going to spend some time looking at experimental design concepts as a data scientist you are a scientist and as such you need to have the ability to design proper experiments to best answer your data science questions so first question for you might be what does experimental design mean experimental design is organizing an experiment so that you have the correct data and enough of it to clearly and effectively answer your data science question This process involves clearly formulating your question in advance of any data collection, designing the best setup possible to gather the data to answer your question, identifying problems or sources of error in your design, and only then collecting the appropriate data. Another question that comes to mind is why should you care? Going into an analysis, you need to have a plan in advance of what you are going to do and how you are going to analyze the data. If you do the wrong analysis you can come to the wrong conclusions. We have seen many examples of this exact scenario play out in the scientific community over the years. There's an entire website Retraction Watch dedicated to identifying papers that have been retracted or removed from the literature as a result of poor scientific practices. And sometimes those poor practices are a result of poor experimental design and analysis. Occasionally these erroneous conclusions can have sweeping effects particularly in the field of human health. For example, here we have a paper that was trying to predict the effects of a person's genome on their response to different chemotherapies to guide which patient receives which drugs to best treat their cancer. As you can see, this paper was retracted over 4 years after it was initially published. In that time this data which was later shown to have numerous problems in their setup and cleaning was cited in nearly 450 other papers that may have used these erroneous results to bolster their own research plans on top of this this wrongly analyzed data was used in clinical trials to determine cancer patient treatment plans when the stakes are this high experimental design is paramount so there are a lot of concepts and terms inherent to experimental design Let's go over some of these now. Independent variable aka factor, the variable that the experimenter manipulates and it does not depend on other variables that are being measured, often displayed on the x axis. Dependent variable, the variable that is expected to change as a result of changes in the independent variable, often displayed on the y axis so that changes in x, the independent variable affect changes in y. So when you are designing an experiment you have to decide what variables you will measure and which you will manipulate to affect changes in other measured variables. Additionally you must develop your hypothesis essentially an educated guess as to the relationship between your variables and the outcome of your experiment. Let's do an example experiment now. Let's say for example that I have a hypothesis that as shoe size increases literacy also increases. In this case in designing my experiment I would choose a measure of literacy for example reading fluency as my variable that depends on an individual's shoe size to answer this question I will design an experiment in which I measure the shoe size and literacy level of 100 individuals sample size is the number of experimental subjects you will include in your experiment there are ways to pick an optimal sample size that you will cover in later courses Before I collect my data though I need to consider if there are problems with this experiment that might cause an erroneous result in this case my experiment may be fatally flawed by a confounder so what is confounder a confounder is an extraneous variable that may affect the relationship between the dependent and independent variables in our example since age affects foot size and literacy is affected by age 
If we see any relationship between shoe size and literacy, the relationship may actually be due to age. Age is confounding our experimental design. To control for this, we can make sure we also measure the age of each individual so that we can take into account the effects of age on literacy as well. Another way we could control for age's effect on literacy would be to fix the age of all participants. If everyone we study is the same age, then we have removed the possible effect of age on literacy. In other experimental design paradigms, a control group may be appropriate. This is when you have a group of experimental subjects that are not manipulated. So if you were studying the effect of a drug on survival, you would have a group that received the drug and a group that did not. This way you can compare the effects of the drug in the treatment versus control group. In these study designs, there are other strategies we can use to control for confounding effects. One, we can blind the subjects to their assigned treatment group. Sometimes when a subject knows that they are in a treatment group, for example, receiving the experimental drug, they can feel better, not from the drug itself, but from knowing that they are receiving treatment. This is known as the placebo effect. To combat this, often participants are blinded to the treatment group they are in. This is usually achieved by giving the control group a mock treatment. For example, given a sugar pill they are told is the drug. In this way, if the placebo effect is causing a problem with your experiment, both groups should experience it equally. And this strategy is at the heart of many of these studies, spreading any possible confounding effects equally across the groups being compared. For example, if you think age is a possible confounding effect, making sure that both groups have similar ages and age ranges will help to mitigate any effect age may be having on your dependent variable. The effect of age is equal between your two groups. This balancing of confounders is often achieved by randomization. Generally, we don't know what will be a confounder beforehand. To help lessen the risk of accidentally biasing one group to be enriched for a confounder, you can randomly assign individuals to each of your groups. This means that any potential confounding variables should be distributed between each group roughly equally to help eliminate or reduce systematic errors. There is one final concept of experimental design that we need to cover in this lesson and that is replication. Replication is pretty much what it sounds like, repeating an experiment with different experimental subjects. A single experiment's results may have occurred by chance. A confounder was unevenly distributed across your groups. There was a systematic error in the data collection. There were some outliers, etc. However, if you can repeat the experiment and collect a whole new set of data and still come to the same conclusion, your study is much stronger. Also at the heart of replication is that it allows you to measure the variability of your data more accurately, which allows you to better assess whether any differences you see in your data are significant. Once you have collected and analyzed your data, one of the next steps of being a good citizen scientist is to share your data and code for analysis. Now that you have a GitHub account and we have shown you how to keep your version control data and analysis on GitHub, this is a great place to share your code. In fact, hosted on GitHub, the Leak Group has developed a guide that has great advice for how to best share data. Link for that will be provided in blog post. One of the many things often reported in experiments is a value called the p-value. This is a value that tells you the probability that the results of your experiment were observed by chance. This is a very important concept in statistics that we will be covering in depth in our statistical inference course. If you want to know more, I will provide the link to the video explaining more about p-values in our blog post. What you need to look out for is when you manipulate p-values towards your own end. Often when your p-values is less than 0.05, in other words, there is a 5% chance that the differences you saw were observed by chance. A result is considered significant. But if you do 20 tests, by chance you would expect one of the 20, which is 5% to be significant. In the age of the big data, testing 20 hypothesis is a very easy proposition. And this is where the term p-hacking comes from. This is when you exhaustively search a dataset to find patterns and correlations that appear statistically significant by virtue of the sheer number of tests you have performed. These spurious correlations can be reported as significant and if you perform enough tests, you can find a dataset and analysis that will show you what you wanted to see. Check out this 538 activity where you can manipulate and filter data and perform a series of tests. 
such that you can get the data to find whatever relationship you want. Link will be provided in the blog post. XKCD mocks this concept in a comic testing the link between jelly beans and acne. Clearly there is no link there. But if you test enough jelly beans colors, eventually one of them will be correlated with acne at p value less than 0.05. In this lecture we will talk about data science process so what is data science process the data science process is a structured approach to solving data related problems it involves several stages from problem definition to model deployment here's a brief uh, overview of the data science process in R uh, first step is uh, uh, to clearly define the problem you are trying to solve this involves understanding the business problem identifying the stakeholders and specifying the data requirements. Um, second step, once uh, you have defined the problem, the next step is to collect the data. This may involve obtaining data from various sources such as databases, APIs or web scrapping. After collecting the data, the next step is to explore and analyze the data. This involves cleaning the data, uh, summarizing the data using descriptive uh, statistics and uh, visualizing the data using graphs and charts. Once uh, the data is explored, the next step is to prepare the data for analysis. Uh, this involves uh, transforming the data into a format that is uh, suitable for analysis, such as reshaping the data, creating new variables, and filtering out irrelevant data. Uh, the next step is to build the model. With the data prepared, uh, the next step is to build the model. This involves uh, selecting a modeling technique that is appropriate for the problem at hand and using R to develop the model. Once the model is built, the next step is to e evaluate its uh, performance. This involves uh, testing uh, the model on a holdout uh, data set and, uh, and assessing uh, uh, its accuracy and uh, robustness. Only if the model is deemed uh, satisfactory, the next step is to deploy the model. This may involve integrating the model into a production system, creating a user interface or providing documentation for end users. R is a popular programming language for data science because it provides a wide range of tools for data manipulation, visualization and statistical modeling. R also has a large community of users and a wealth of resources such as packages and tutorials that can be used throughout the data science process. Here is an example of a research study that follows the R uh, data science process in R, which is uh, predicting house prices using regression models, a case study in R. The first step is to define the problem. The goal of this uh, study is to build uh, regression models that can accurately predict house prices based on uh, a set of predictive variables. In this step, we are defining the problem we want to solve. Specifically, we want to build uh, regression models that can be uh, accurately predict house prices based on a set of predictive variables. The goal of this study is to help people make informed decisions when buying or selling a house. Accurately predicting the price of a house is important because it can affect how much someone is willing to pay for a house, how much a seller can expect to receive for their house and whether a lender is willing to provide a mortgage for a given property. To achieve this goal, we also need to identify the predictive variables that are mostly uh, that are most strongly related uh, to house prices. In the case of the Boston housing data set, these predictive vari variables might include things like the crime rate in the neighborhood the average number of rooms per dwelling, the distance uh, to employment centers, and so on. Once we have identified the problem and identified the relevant predictive variables, then we can proceed with the next step, which is to collect the data. Uh, the study uses the Boston housing data set, which is available in R as part of the mass package. In, in this step of data science process, we need to collect the data that will be used to build and evaluate the regression model. In this example, we are using the Boston housing data set, which is a well-known data set in the machine learning community. The Boston housing data set contains information on various attributes of houses in the Boston area, such as the crime rate in the neighborhood, the average number of rooms per dwelling, 
the age of the house and the median value of owner occupying uh, homes the data set contains a total of 506 observations each with 14 variables the boston housing data set is available in r as part of the mass package which is a collection of data sets and functions for data analysis and visualization to assess the data set in r the researchers would need to install the mass package and uh, load the data set into uh, their r environment using the data function once we have collected the data we can um, begin to explore and pre-process the data as described in the next steps of the uh, data science process by using a well-known and well-documented uh, data set like the boston housing data set we can ensure that our analysis is comparable to other studies and that our uh, results are trustworthy now third step is to explore the data the study uses uh, descriptive statistics and visualizations to summarize and explore the data set such as histograms scatter plots and uh, correlation matrices in the third step of the data science process we need to explore the data that we have collected in order to gain a better understanding of its characteristics and patterns this uh, exploration can help identify potential issues with the data reveal interesting relationship between variables and uh, suggest possible directions for the analysis to explore the data we uh, in this example will use descriptive uh, statistics and visualizations descriptive statistics are uh, numerical summaries of the data such as mean median standard de um, deviation and quartiles these uh, statistics can help provide a general overview of the data set and can be useful in detecting outliers skewness or other unusual uh, features visualizations on the other hand are graphical representations of the data they can provide a more intuitive understanding of the data and can help identify patterns or trends that may not be immediately apparent from the numerical summaries alone in this example we use several types of visualizations to explore the boston housing data set such as histograms scatter plots and correlation matrices by the way uh, histograms are plots that show the frequency uh, distribution of a variable usually by dividing the range of a variable into bins and uh, counting the number of observations in each bin histograms can help reveal the shape of the distribution the presence of outliers or uh, skewness and the overall range of the variable while uh, scatter plots are plots that show the re relationship between two variables by plotting the values of one variable on x axis and the values of the other variable on y axis scatter plots can help uh, reveal the strength and direction of the relationship between the variables as well as the presence of outliers or nonlinear patterns and correlation matrices are tables that uh, show the pairwise correlations between variables correlations can help reveal the strength and direction of the relationships between variables and can be useful in identifying potential uh, multi linearity issues uh, that may affect the performance of the regression models by using descriptive statistics and visualizations we in this example can gain a better understanding of the Boston housing data set and uh, identify any potential issues that may need to be addressed in the next steps of the data science process. Next step is uh, uh, preparing the data. In this step of the data science process, we need to prepare the data for use in building the regression models. This involves cleaning and pre-processing the data so that it is in a suitable format for analysis. In this example, we clean and pre-process the Boston housing data set by, by performing several tasks, including uh, removing missing values. Missing values can cause problems for regression models, so it's important to deal with uh, them appropriately. In this case, we remove any observations with missing values rather than trying to impute the missing values. Next, uh, scaling the variables. Scaling the variables can help ensure that they are on a similar scale which can improve the performance of the regression models. In this example, we use the scale function to standardize the values of the predictive variables so that they have a mean zero and a standard deviation of one. Then creating uh, dummy variables for categorical variables. 
some of the variables in the boston housing data set are categorical meaning that uh, they can take on a, a limited number of discrete values in order to uh, include these variables in the regression models we create dummy variables for each uh, categorical uh, variable this involves creating a binary variable for each uh, level of the categorical variable indicating whether a given observation falls into that level or not by performing these cleaning and pre processing tasks uh, we can ensure that the data is ready to, to use in building the regression models we can now move on to the next uh, steps of the data science process which involve building and evaluating the models in the fifth step of the data science process we build regression models to predict house prices based on the predictive variables Regression models are a type of statistical model that can be used to identify relationships between one or more predictive variables and a response variable. In this example, we built several uh, regression models using the cleaned and pre-processed uh, Boston housing data set. Specifically, we built uh, linear regression, multiple regression, ridge regression and lasso regression models. Linear Regression is a simple regression model that assumes a linear relationship between the predictive variables and the response variable. While uh, multiple regression on the other hand extends uh, linear regression by allowing uh, for multiple predictive variables. Ridge regression and lasso regression are variations of linear regression that add a penalty term to the objective function in order to reduce overfitting. To evaluate the performance of these models, we use cross-validation. Cross-validation is a technique for assessing how well a model generalizes to new data. It involves uh, uh, splitting the data set into a training set and a validation set, and then fitting the model to the training set and evaluating its performance on the, on the validation set. This process is repeated several times with different splits of the data in order to obtain an estimate of the model's uh, generalization performance. By building and evaluating several different uh, regression models using cross validation, we can uh, we can identify the model that performs the best at uh, predicting house prices based on the predictive variables. We can then use this model to make predictions on new data or to test hypotheses about the relationships uh, between the predictive variables and the response variable. In the sixth uh, step of the data science process, we evaluate the performance uh, of the regression models that we built in the previous step. There are various metrics that can be used to evaluate the performance of regression models. And in, uh, and in this example, we use root mean squared error, uh, mean absolute error and R squared. Root mean squared error and mean uh, absolute error are measures of how well the model predicts the actual house prices. Root mean squared error measures the average difference between the predicted house prices and the actual house prices and is calculated by taking the square root of the mean squared error. Mean absolute error is another measure of the average difference between the predicted and actual house prices, but it takes the absolute value of the difference rather than squaring it. R squared is a measure of how well the model fits the data. It indicates the proportion of variance in the response variable that can be explained by the predictive variables. An R squared value of 1 uh, indicates a perfect fit, while a value of 0 indicates that the model explains uh, none of the variance in the response variable. By evaluating the performance of the regression models using these metrics, we can assess how well each model predicts house prices based on the predictive variables. We can also compare the performance of the different models and use this information to select the best model for their needs. In some cases, we may also use these metrics to identify areas where the model can be improved or to identify potential issues with the model's assumptions or implementation. In the final step of the data science process, we will deploy the best performing model to provide predictions for new data. We also provide recommendations for how the model should be used in practice. In this step, we will likely first uh, select the best performing model based on the evaluation matrix from the previous step. Once we have uh, selected the model, we will need to implement it in a production environment so that it can be used to make predictions on new data. This may involve integrating the model into an existing software system 
or building a new system around the model. We will also need to provide documentation for end users such as technical documentation uh, on how the model was built and how to use it as well as user guides and tutorials. This documentation should be clear, concise and accessible to a wide range of users including those who may not have a technical background. Finally, we may also provide recommendations for how the model should be used in practice such as providing guidelines for how often the model should be retrained or updated or identifying potential limitations or caveats that users uh, should be aware of, uh, of when uh, interpreting the model's predictions. Overall, the goal of deploying the model is to make it easy for end users to use the model to make predictions on new data while also providing them with the necessary information and guidance to interpret the results correctly. That The example that I just explained might be tough for you to understand if you are a beginner but once uh, we are done with our specialization this example will seem easy to you and that's uh, what I want at the end of this specialization for you. Anyways here's the link to the study on github. If you want to check it out you can. I will provide the link in today's blog post. I will explain many such examples and walk you through few projects step by step at the end of uh, our data science specialization series to get you started and get you ready for your data science job. After getting familiar with what is data science, data, data science process and knowing what actually is data scientist, we move towards the next part of getting familiar with the tools will be needed during our data science specialization. First, let's remind ourselves exactly what R is and why we might want to use it. R is both a programming language and an environment focused mainly on statistical analysis and graphics. It will be one of the main tools you use in this and the following courses. R is downloaded from the comprehensive R archive network or CRAN and while this might be your first brush with it, we will be returning to CRAN time and time again when we install packages so keep an eye out. Outside of this course you may be asking yourself why should I use R. The reasons for using R are myriad but some big ones are its popularity. R is quickly becoming the standard language for statistical analysis. This makes R a great language to learn as the more popular a software is the quicker new functionality is developed. The more powerful it becomes and the better the support there is. Additionally, as uh, you can see in the graph below, uh, knowing R is one of the top languages asked for in data scientist job posting. Second, free. This one is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, every aspect of R is free to use, unlike some other stats packages you may have heard of, for example, SAS, SP, SS. So there is no cost barrier to using R. Uh, third, R is a very versatile language. We have talked about its use in stats and in graphing, but its use can be expanded to many different functions from making websites, uh, making maps using GIS data, analyzing language and even making automated lectures and videos. For whatever task you have in mind, there is often a package available for download that does exactly that. And the reason that the functionality of R is so extensive is the community that has been built around R. Individuals have come together to make packages that add to the functionality of R and more are being developed every day. Particularly for people just getting started out with R, its community is a huge benefit. Due to its popularity, there are uh, multiple forums that have pages and pages dedicated to solving R problems. We talked about this in the getting help lesson. These forums are great both for finding other people who have had the same problem as you and posting your own new problems. Now that we have spent some time looking at the benefits of R, it is time to install it. We will go over installation for both Windows and Mac. But uh, know that these are general guidelines and small details are likely to change uh, subsequent to the making of this lecture. Use this as a scaffold. For both Windows and Mac machines, we start at the CRAN homepage. Uh, if you are on a Windows computer, Follow the link uh, uh, download R for Windows and follow uh, directions there. 
if this is your first time installing R, go to the base distribution and click on the link. At the top of the page, uh, that should say something like download R version number for Windows. This will uh, download an executable file for installation. I will cancel uh, the download here as I, as I have already installed it. Once the installation is complete, open the executable file and if uh, prompted uh, by a security warning, allow it to run. Select the language you prefer during installation and agree to the licensing information. You will next be prompted uh, for a destination location. This will likely be uh, defaulted to program files in a subfolder called R followed by another directory of the version number. Unless you have any issues with this, the default uh, location is perfect. You will then be prompted uh, to select which components uh, should be installed. Unless you are running short on memory, installing all of the components is desirable. Next, uh, you will be asked about startup options. Uh, and again, the defaults are fine for this. You will then be asked uh, where setup should place uh, shortcuts. This is completely up to you. You can allow it to uh, add the program to the start menu or you can click the box at the bottom that says uh, uh, to not create a start menu. Finally, you will be asked uh, whether you want a desktop or quick launch icon up to you. I do not recommend changing the defaults for the registry entries though. After this window, the installation should begin. Test uh, that the installation worked by opening R for the first time. If your terminal looks like this, it means that the R is running. Congrats, you have installed R now. Let's install uh, R for Mac operating system. If you are on a Mac computer, follow the link uh, download R for Mac uh, operating system. There uh, you can find the various R versions for download. Note if you uh, your Mac is older than uh, OS 11 Big Sur, you will need to follow the directions on this page for downloading older versions of R that are compatible with those operating systems. You can see this uh, download is for uh, operating system 10.13 high say era uh, and as you uh, scroll further down uh, there are different versions of R for different Mac operating systems. Click on the link to the most recent version of R. Uh, download a PKG file. Open the PKG file and follow the prompts uh, as provided by the installer. First click continue on the welcome page and again on the important uh, information window page. Next, uh, you will be presented with a software license agreement. Again, continue. Next, you may be asked to select a destination for R, either available to all users or to a specific disk. Select whichever you feel is best suited to, uh, to your setup. Finally, you will be at the standard uh, install page. R selects a default uh, directory and if you are happy with that location, go ahead and click install. At this point, you may be prompted to type uh, in the admin password. Do so and uh, the install will begin. Once the installation is finished, go to your applications and find R. Test that the installation worked by opening R for the first time. We have installed R in the previous video and can open the R interface to input code. But uh, there are other ways to interface with R and one of those ways is using R Studio. In this lesson, we will get uh, R Studio installed on your computer. If you have not installed R yet on your computer, then you cannot install R Studio. Installation of R is one of the requirement to install R Studio. So first question I wanted to answer here is what is R Studio? R Studio is a graphical user interface for R that allows you to write, edit and store code, generate, view and store, uh, and store plots, manage files, objects and data frames and integrate with uh, version control systems. To name a file of uh, its functions, uh, we will be exploring exactly what R Studio uh, can do for you in future lessons. But for anybody just starting out with R coding, the visual nature of this program as an interface for R is a huge benefit. Now let's install R Studio. Thankfully, installation of R Studio is fairly straightforward. First, you go to the R Studio uh, download page. We want to download the R Studio. 
desktop version of the software so uh, click on the appropriate download under that heading and uh, you will see a list of uh, installers for supported platforms the various versions of RStudio are available for different operating systems at this point the installation process uh, diverges for Macs and Windows so follow the instructions for the appropriate OS let's begin with uh, Windows first for Windows select the RStudio installer for the Windows editors 10 or 11 this will initiate the download process when the download is complete open this executable file to assess uh, the installation wizard you may be presented with a security warning at this time allow it to make changes uh, to your computer following this the installation wizard will open following the defaults on each of the windows of the wizard is appropriate for installation in brief on the welcome screen uh, click next uh, if you want rstudio installed elsewhere browse through your file uh, system Otherwise, it will likely default uh, to the program files folder. This is appropriate. Click next. On this final page, allow RStudio to create a start menu shortcut. Click install. RStudio is now being installed. Wait for this process to finish. After installation, your screen will look like this. RStudio is now installed on your computer. Click finish. Check that RStudio is working appropriately by opening it from your start menu. Now RStudio is running and will look like this. Let's install it now for Mac. OS for Max, select the Max OS 11 Plus Studio installer. This will initiate the download process. If your Mac version is older than this, you can further uh, scroll down and find the download link for your version. When the download is complete, click on the downloaded file and it will begin to install. When this is finished, the applications window will open. Drag the RStudio file into your application folder to complete installation for RStudio. Now test the installation by opening your applications folder and then opening the RStudio software. RStudio is running now and would uh, look like this. In the last couple of lessons we installed R and RStudio. In this lesson we will familiarize ourselves with the various components and functionality of RStudio. This lesson provides a cheat sheet of the RStudio environment, so head over to the RStudio. So RStudio can be roughly divided into four quadrants, each with specific and varied functions, plus a main menu bar. When you first open RStudio, you should see a window that looks roughly like this. Now uh, you may be missing the upper left quadrant and instead have the left uh, side of the screen with just one region, console. Uh, like this if uh, this is the case go to the file new file and then our script and now it should more closely resemble the image you can change the sizes of each of the various quadrants by hovering your mouse over uh, the spaces between the quadrants and click uh, dragging the divider to resize the sections we will go through each of the regions and describe some of their main functions it would be impossible to cover everything that RStudio can do. So we urge you to explore RStudio on your own too. You can see the main menu bar runs across the top of your screen and should have two rows. The first row should be a fairly standard menu starting with file and edit. Below that there is a row of icons that are shortcuts for functions that uh, you will frequently use. To start let's uh, explore the main sections of the menu bar that you will use. The first being the file menu. Here uh, we can open new or saved uh, files, open new projects or save projects, save our current uh, document or close RStudio. If you mouse over uh, the new file, a new menu will appear that suggests the various file uh, formats available to you. R script and R markdown files are the most common file types for use, but uh, you can also generate R notebooks web apps, websites or slide presentations. If you click on any uh, one of these, a new tab in the source quadrant will open. We will spend more time in the future lesson on, on our markdown files and their use. Next we have added code, view, plots and uh, session uh, menu. The session menu has R specific functions in which you can restart, interrupt or terminate R. This can be helpful if R isn't behaving or is stuck and uh, you want to stop what it is doing and start from scratch. 
the tools menu is a treasure trove of functions for you to explore for now uh, you should know that uh, this is where you can go to install new packages set up your version control software and set uh, your options and preferences for how our studio looks and functions for now uh, we will leave this alone but be sure to explore these menus on your own once you have a bit more experience with our studio and see what you can change to best suit your preferences now this um, region should look familiar to you when you opened R, uh, you were presented with the console this is where you type and execute commands and uh, where the output of said command is displayed to execute your first command try typing 1 plus 1 then enter at the prompt you should see the output 2 below your command you can also try something advanced uh, in your console for example uh, And hit enter here I created a matrix with four rows and two columns uh, with values from 1 to 8 to view this matrix first look into the environment quadrant let me increase the size of this quadrant now you can see that we created a, a matrix uh, with four rows and two columns click anywhere on the example line and a new tab on the source quadrant should appear showing the matrix you created any data frame or matrix that you create in R can be viewed this way in R Studio. R Studio also tells you some um, information about the object in the environment like whether it is a list or a data frame or if it contains numbers, integers or characters. This is a very helpful information to have as some functions only work with certain classes of data and knowing what kind of data you have is the first step to that. In this quadrant uh, you can see the memory used by our session along with this you can also import your workspace save your workspace the quadrant has uh, two other tabs running across the top of it we will just look at the history tab now let me increase the size of it your history tab uh, should look uh, something like this here you will see the commands that we have run in this session of R if you click on any one of them uh, you can click to console uh, or to source and this will either rerun the command in the console or will move the command to the source respectively. Uh, do so now for uh, your example matrix and send it to the source. The source panel is where you will be spending most of your time in R Studio. This is where uh, you store the R commands that you want to save for later either as a record of what you did uh, or as a way to rerun the code we will spend a lot of time in this quadrant when we discuss our markdown but for now click the save icon along the top of this quadrant and save the script as uh, your first r script don't forget to add dot r now you will always have a record of creating this matrix the final region we will look at occupies the bottom right of the R Studio window. Let me increase the size of this quadrant. In this quadrant, uh, five tabs run across the top. Files, Plots, Packages, Help, Viewer and Presentation. In Files, you can see all of the files in your current working directory. If uh, this isn't where you want to save or retrieve files from, you can also change the current working directory in this tab using this uh, ellipsis in the far right and finding the desired folder. You can create a new folder and then setting this new folder as the working directory. In the plots tab, if you generate a plot with your code, it will appear here. You can use the arrows to navigate to previously generated plots. The zoom function will open the plot in a new window that is much larger than the quadrant. Export is how uh, you save the plot. You can either save it as an image or as a PDF. The cross icon will remove your current plot. Uh, the broom icon clears all plots from memories. The packages tab will be explored more in depth in the next lesson on, on our packages. 
here you can see all the packages you have installed loaded or and unload these packages and update them the help tab is where you find the documentation for your r packages and various functions in the upper right of this panel there is a search function for when you have a specific function or package in question Now that we have installed R and R Studio and have a basic understanding of how they work together, we can get at what makes R so special and that is packages. So what is an R package? So far anything we have played around with an R uses uh, the base R system. Base R or everything included in R when you download it has rather basic functionality for statistics and plotting but it can sometimes be limiting. To expand upon R's basic functionality, people have developed packages. A package is a collection of functions, data and code conveniently provided in a nice complete format for you. At the time of recording this lecture, there are just over 19,266 packages available to download, each with their own specialized functions and code, all for some different purposes. For a really in-depth look at R packages, what they are and how to develop them, you can check out Hadley Wickham's book from O'Reilly, R packages. Link will be provided in our blog post, so definitely check that and please follow our blog post too. Let alone watching these lectures won't help much. You will have to read and practice what we provide along with these lectures. So a package is not to be confused with a library. A library is the place where the package is located on your computer. To think of an analogy, a library is well just a library and package is like a book within that library. The library is where the books or packages are located. Packages are what make R so unique. Not only does base R uh, have some great functionality, but these packages greatly expand its functionality. And perhaps most social of all, each package is developed and published by the R community at large and deposited in repositories. So what are repositories? A repository is a central location where many developed packages are located and available for download. There are three big repositories. First, uh, CRAN, Comprehensive R Archive Network, R's main repository uh, which has more than 18,000 packages available. Second is Bioconductor, a repository mainly for bioinformatic uh, focused packages. Third is GitHub, a very popular open source repository but not R specific. Take a second to explore the links to these repositories that are provided to you in our uh, today's blog on R packages and check out the various packages that are out there. So you know where to find packages, but there are so many of them. How can you find a package that will do what you are trying to do in R? There are a few different avenues for exploring packages. First, uh, Grand groups all of its packages by their functionality or topic into 35 themes. It calls uh, this its task view. This at least allows you to narrow the packages you can look through to a topic relevant to your interests. Second, there is a great website R documentation which is a search engine for packages and functions from CRAN, Bioconductor and GitHub. If you have a task in mind, this is a great way to search for specific packages to help you accomplish that task. It also has a task view like CRAN that allows you to browse themes. More often if you have a specific task in mind, uh, googling that task followed by R package is a great place to start. From there looking at tutorials, VNets and forums uh, for people already doing what you want to do is a great way to find relevant packages. Now how do you install packages? There are many ways to install a package. Uh, if you are installing from CRAN repository, use the install.packages function with the name of the package you want to install in quotes between the parentheses. Note you can use either uh, single or double quotes. For example, if you want to install the package ggplot2, you would use install.packages, parenthesis, uh, quotes, ggplot2, quotes closed and round bracket closed. Try doing so in your R console. Uh, this command downloads the ggplot2 package from CRAN and install it onto your computer. 
If you want to install multiple packages at once, you can do so by using a character vector like install dot packages round parenthesis c for concatenation again round parenthesis first package name between quotes followed by another package name between quotes and uh, so on if you want to use r studios graphical interface to install packages go to the tools menu and the first option should be install packages if installing from cran select it as the repository and type the desired packages in the appropriate box the bioconductor repository uses their own method to install packages. First to get the basic functions required to install through bioconductor, use source function with uh, the link to the bioconductor uh, repository which is uh, bioclite.r. This makes the main install function of bioconductor bioclite function available to you. Following this you call the package you want to install in quotes between the parentheses of the bioclite command just like in the slides. Next is uh, installing from github. This is a more specific case that you probably won't run into too often. In the event uh, you want to do uh, this you first must find the package you want on github and take uh, note of both the package name and uh, the author of the package. I will provide the link to the guide for installing from github but the general workflow is like install dot packages parenthesis and uh, dev tools between the quotes followed by library uh, parenthesis dev tools install github function uh, with author and package name just like in slides now you have installed a package but installing a package does not make its functions immediately available to you first you must load the package into r to do so use the library function Think of this like any other software you install on your computer. Just because you have installed a program doesn't mean it's automatically running. You have to open the program. Same with R, you have installed it, but uh, now you have to open it. For example, to open the ggplot2 package, you will run library parenthesis ggplot2. One important thing to note here, do not put the package name in quotes, unlike when you are installing the packages. The library command does not accept package name in quotes. There is an order to loading packages. Some packages uh, require other packages to be loaded first, which is called dependencies. That packages um, manual or help pages will help you out in finding that order if they are picky. If you want to load a package using the RStudio interface, in the lower uh, right quadrant, there is a tab called packages that lists out all of the packages and a brief description as well as the version number of all the packages you have installed. To load a package just click on the checkbox beside the package name. Now once you have got a package there are a few things you might need to know how to do. Checking what packages you have installed. If you are not sure if you have already installed a package or want to check what packages are installed you can use either of install.packages function or library function with nothing between the parentheses to check. In RStudio that package tab introduced earlier is another way to look at all of the packages you have installed. You can check what packages need an update with a call to the function all.packages function. Uh, this will identify all packages that have been updated since you installed them or last updated them. To update all packages, use update.packages. If you only want to update a specific package, just use once again install.packages function with the package name uh, inside the parenthesis between quotes. Within the RStudio interface, still in that packages tab, you can click update, which will uh, list all of the packages that are not up to date. It gives you the option to update all of your packages or allows you to select specific packages to be uh, updated. You will want to periodically check in on your packages and check if you have fallen out of date. Be careful though, sometimes an update can change the functionality of certain functions. So if you rerun some old code, the command may be changed or perhaps even outright gone and you will need to update your code too. Sometimes you want to unload a package in the middle of a script the package you have loaded may not play nicely with another package you want to use. 
to unload a given package you can use the detach function for example detach like i used the detach function in the slides that would unload the ggplot2 uh, package that we loaded earlier within the r within the r studio interface in the packages tab you can simply unload a package by unchecking the box beside the package name if you no longer want to have a package installed you can simply uninstall it using the function remove.packages like i used uh, in the slides try that but then actually reinstall the ggplot2 package it's a super useful plotting package within r studio in the packages tab clicking on the cross at the end of a packages row will uninstall that package sometimes when you are looking at a package that you might want to install you will see that it requires a certain version of r to run to know if you can use that package you need to know what version of r you are running one way to know your r version is to check when you first open r or r studio the first thing it outputs in the console tells you what version of r is currently running if you didn't pay attention at the beginning you can type version into the console and it will output information on the r version you are running another helpful command is session info function it will tell you what version of r you are running along with a listing of all of the packages you have loaded the output of this command is a great detail to include when posting a question to forums it tells potential helpers a lot of information about your operating system r and the packages plus their version numbers that you are using in all of this information about packages we have not actually discussed how to use a packages functions first you need to know what functions are included within a package to do this you can look at the help pages included in all packages in the console you can use the help function to assess a packages help files try help function just like i did in the slides and you will see all of the many functions that ggplot2 provides within the r studio interface you can assess the help files through the packages tab again clicking on any package name should open up the associated help files in the help tab found in that same quadrant besides the packages tab clicking on any one of these help pages will take you to that functions help page that tells you what that function is for and how to use it once you know what function within a package you want to use you simply call it in the console like any other function we have been using throughout this lesson once a package has been loaded it is as if it were a part of the base r functionality if you still have questions about what functions within a package are right for you or how to use them many packages include vnets these are extended help files that include an overview of the package and its functions but often they go the extra mile and include detailed examples of how to use the functions in plain words that you can follow along with to see how to use the package to see the vnets include in a package you can use the browse vnets function for example let's look at the vnets included in ggplot2 use the browse vnets function like i did in the slides you should see that there are two included vnets extending ggplot2 and the aesthetic specifications exploring the aesthetic specifications vnet is a great example of how vnets can be helpful clear instructions on how to use the included functions Now we have spent a lot of time getting R and R Studio working, learning about different functionalities in R Studio and uh, R packages. You are practically an expert at uh, this. There is one major functionality of R or R Studio that we would be remiss to not include in your introduction to R, and that is R Markdown. R Markdown is a way of creating fully reproducible documents in which both text and code can be combined. such as bullets points bold text italics text links or run inline r code and by the end of this lesson you should be able to do each of those things too 
and more. Despite these documents all starting as plain text, you can render them into HTML pages or PDFs or Word documents or even presentation slides. The symbols you use to signal for example bold or italics is compatible with all of these formats. One of the main benefits is the reproducibility of using R Markdown. Since you can easily combine text and code chunks into one document, you can easily integrate introductions, hypothesis, your code that you are running, the results of that code and your conclusions all in one document. Sharing what you did, why you did it and how it turned out become so simple and that person you share it with can rerun your code and get the exact same answers you got. That's what we mean about reproducibility. But also sometimes you will be working on a project that takes many weeks to complete. You want to be able to see what you did a long time ago and perhaps be reminded exactly why you were doing this and you can see exactly what you ran and the results of that code and R Markdown documents allow you to do that. Another major benefit of R Markdown is that since it is plain text, it works very well with version control systems. It is easy to track what character changes occur between commits, unlike other formats that are not plain text. For example, in one version of this lesson, I may have forgotten to bold this word. When I catch my mistake, I can make the plain text changes to signal I would like that word bolded and in the comment you can see the exact character changes that occurred to now make the word bold. Check out the video that the R Studio developers have released about R Markdown and what it is. The link will be provided in the blog post. Another selfish benefit of R Markdown is how easy it is to use. Like everything in R, this extended functionality comes from an R package called uh, R Markdown. All you need to do to install it is running install.packages with R Markdown name. This query in the console region. And that's it. You are ready to go. Now uh, load the R Markdown package by using this command in the console region. This will load the package. To create an R Markdown document, go to the file and then new file and then select R Markdown. Name your R Markdown file and this will open the R Markdown document. You will be presented with the window like this. I have filled in a title and an author and switch the output format to a PDF. Explore around this window and the tabs along the left to see all the different formats that you can output to. When you are done click OK and a new window should open with a little explanation on R Markdown files. There are three main sections of an R Markdown document. The first section is the header at the top bounded by three dashes. This is where you can specify details like the title, your name, the date and what kind of document you want output. If you filled in the blanks in the window earlier, this should be filled out for you. Also on this page, you can see the text section. For example, this one which starts with double dash R Markdown. We will talk more about what this means in a second. But this section will render as text when you produce the PDF of this file and all of the formatting you will learn generally applies to this section. And finally you will see code chunks. These are bounded by triple backticks. These are pieces of R code chunks that you can run right from uh, within your document and the output of this code will be included in the PDF when you create it. The easiest way to see how each of these sections behave is to produce the PDF. When you are done with a document in R Markdown, you set to net your plain text and code into your final document. To do so, click on the net button along the top of the source panel. When you do so, it will prompt you to save the document as an RMD file do so and you should see a document like this. So here you can see the content of the header was rendered into a title followed by your name and the date. The text chunks produced a section header called R Markdown which is followed by two paragraphs of text. Following this you can see the R code summary cars importantly followed by the output of running that code and further down you will see code that ran to produce a plot and then that plot. 
This is one of the huge benefits of R Markdown, rendering the results to code in line. Go back to the R Markdown file that produced this PDF and see if you can see how signify you want text bolded. Hint is to look at the word net and see what it is surrounded by. At this point, I hope we have convinced you that R Markdown is a useful way to keep your code and data and have set you up to be able to play around with it. To get you started, we will practice some of the formatting that is inherent to our markdown documents. To start, let's look at bolding and italicizing text. To bold the text, you surround it by two asterisks on either side. Similarly, to italicize the text, you surround the word with a single asterisk on either side. We have also seen the default document that you can make section headers. To do this, you put a series of hash marks. The number of hash marks determines what level of heading it is. One hash is the highest level and will make the largest text. Let us try this. Two hashes is the next highest level and so on. Play around with this formatting and make a series of headers like so. The other thing we have seen so far is code chunks. To make an R code chunk, you can type the three backticks followed by the curly brackets surrounding a lowercase r. Put your code on a new line and end the chunk with three more backticks. Thankfully, R Studio recognized you would be doing this a lot and there are shortcuts namely Ctrl plus Alt plus I for Windows or CMD plus Option plus I for Macs. Additionally, along the top of the source uh, quadrant, there is the insert button that will also produce an empty code chunk. Try making an empty code chunk inside it type the code print hello world if you are not ready to knit your document yet but want to see the output of your code select the line of code you want to run and use control plus enter or hit the run button along the top of your source window the text hello world should be output in your console window if you have multiple lines of code in a chunk and you want to run them all in one go you can run the entire chunk by using Ctrl plus Shift plus Enter or hitting the green arrow button on the right side of the chunk or going to the run menu and select run current chunk. One final thing we will go into detail on is making bulleted lists like the one at the top of this lesson. Lists are easily created by preceding each prospective bullet point by a single dash followed by a space. Importantly, at the end of each bullet's line, and with two spaces. This is a quirk of R markdown that will cause spacing problems if not included. Let us try this. Now knit this document. You should remember all the changes that we made to this document. You can see here that we created two extra headings, one with the single hash whose size is greater than the previous heading and one with the three hash. You can also see that we bolded the text as you can see here. You can also see that we italicized the text you can see here we added the extra chunk of code you can see here and the output to that code with this plot you can also see the hello world command and finally you can see the list that we created this is a great starting point and there is so much more you can do with R markdown thankfully R studio developers have produced an R markdown cheat sheet that we urge you to go check out and see everything you can do with R markdown the sky is the limit. Link will be provided in the blog post as every time so check that out. One of the ways people organize their work in R is through the use of R projects. A built-in functionality of R Studio that helps to keep all your related files together. R Studio provides a great guide on how to use projects so definitely check that out. Link will be provided in our today's blog. So what is an R project? When you make a project, it creates a folder where all files will be kept, which is helpful for organizing yourself and keeping multiple projects separate from each other. When you reopen a project, R Studio remembers what files were open and will restore the work environment as if you had never left, which is very helpful when you are starting back up on a project after some time off. Functionally, creating a project in R will create a new folder and assign that as the working directory so that all files generated will be assigned to the same directory. What are the benefits to using R projects? 
The main benefit of using projects is that it starts the organization process off right. It creates a folder for you and now you have a place to store all of your input data, your code and the output of your code. Everything you are working on within a project is self-contained which often means finding things is much easier and there is only one place to look. Also since everything related to one project is all in the same place, it is much easier to share your work with others either by directly sharing the folder or files or by associating it with version control software. We will talk more about linking projects in R with version control systems in a future lesson entirely dedicated to the topic. Finally, since RStudio remembers what documents you had open when you closed the session, it is easier to pick a project up after a break and everything is set up just as you left it. There are three ways to make a project. First from scratch, this will create a new directory for all your files to go in. Second from an existing folder, this will link an existing directory with RStudio. Third is from version control. This will clone an existing project onto your computer. So don't worry too much about this one. You will get more familiar with it in the next few lessons. Let's create a project from scratch which is often what you will be doing. Now open RStudio. Under file select new project. You can also create a project by using projects toolbar and selecting new project in the drop down menu or there is a new project shortcut in the toolbar. Since we are starting from scratch, select new project and a window will appear. Select new directory and when prompted about the project type, select new project. Pick a name for your project and for this time save it to your desktop. This will create a folder on your desktop where all of the files associated with this project will be kept. Click create project then a blank RStudio session should open like this. A few things to note here are in the files quadrant of the screen you can see that RStudio has made this new directory your working directory and generated a single file with the extension .rprog. In the upper right of the window there is a projects toolbar that states the name of your current project and has a drop down menu with a few different options that we will talk about in a second. Now if you want to open an existing project that is as simple as double clicking the .rprog file on your computer, you can accomplish the same from within RStudio by opening RStudio and going to file menu and then open project. You can also use the project toolbar and open the drop down menu and select open project. Quitting a project is as simple as closing your RStudio window. You can quit a project by just closing the RStudio window from here. You can also use the project toolbar by clicking on the drop down menu and choosing close project. Finally, you can go to the file menu and select close project from here and this will do the same. All of these options will quit a project and doing so will cause RStudio to write which documents are currently open so they can be restored when you start backup again and it then closes the R session. When you set up your project you can tell it to save environment. So for example all of your variables and data tables will be preloaded when you reopen the project. But this is not the default behavior. You have to ask RStudio to do so. Now the projects toolbar is also an easy way to switch between projects. Click on the drop down menu and choose open project and find your new project you want to open. This will save the current project, close it and then open the new project within the same window. If you want multiple projects open at the same time, do the same uh, but instead select open project in new session. Now this can also be accomplished through the file menu where those same options are available. When you are setting up a project it can be helpful to start out creating a few directories. Try a few strategies and see what works best for you. But most file structures are set up around having a directory containing the raw data, a directory that you keep scripts or R files in and a directory for the output of your code. For example like this, 
If you set up these folders before you start, it can save your organizational headaches later on in a project when you cannot quite remember where something is. Now that we have got a handle on our R Studio and projects in R Studio, there are a few more things we want to set you up with before moving on to the other courses. Understanding version control, installing Git and linking Git with R Studio. In this lesson, we will give you a basic understanding of version control. We will cover what version control is and some of the benefits. You should be able to understand why we have three whole lessons dedicated to version control and installing it. We will look at what Git and GitHub are and then we will cover much of the commonly used and sometimes confusing vocabulary which is inherent to version control work. We will then quickly go over some best practices to using Git but the best way to get a hang of this all is to use it. Let's get started. So first thing first, what is version control? Version control is a system that records changes that are made to a file or a set of files over time. As you make edits, the version control system takes snapshots of your files and the changes and then saves those snapshots so you can refer or revert back to previous versions later if need be. If you have ever used the track changes feature in Microsoft Word, you have seen a rudimentary type of version control in which the changes to a file are tracked and you can either choose to keep those edits or revert to the original format. Version control systems like Git are like a more sophisticated track changes in that they are far more powerful and are capable of meticulously tracking successive changes on many files with potentially many people working simultaneously on the same groups of files. If you have ever worked collaboratively on a document before, this comic from PhD comics might resonate with you. Hopefully once you have mastered version control software, paper final final to actually final docs will be a thing of the past for you. As we have seen in the example without version control you might be keeping multiple very similar copies of a file and this could be dangerous. You might start editing the wrong version not recognizing that the document labeled final has been further edited to final 2 and now all your new changes have been applied to the wrong file. Version control systems help to solve this problem by keeping a single updated version of each file with a record of all previous versions and a record of exactly what changed between these versions. Which brings us to the next major benefit of version control. It keeps a record of all changes made to the files. This can be of great help when you are collaborating with many people on the same files. The version control software keeps track of who, when and why those specific changes were made. It's like track changes to the extreme. This record is also helpful when developing code. If you realize after some time that you made a mistake and introduced an error, you can find the last time you edited that particular bit of code, see the changes you made and revert back to the original unbroken code, leaving everything else you have done in the meanwhile untouched. Finally, when working with a group of people on the same set of files, version control is helpful for ensuring that you are not making changes to files that conflict with other changes. If you have ever shared a document with another group for editing, you know the frustration of integrating their edits with a document that has changed since you sent the original file. Now you have two versions of that same original document. Version control allows multiple people to work on the same file and then helps merge all of the versions of the file and all of their edits into one cohesive file. Git is a free and open source version control system. It was developed in 2005 and has since become the most commonly used version control system around. Stack Overflow which also sound familiar from our getting help lesson surveyed over 60,000 respondents on which version control system they use and as you can tell from the chart below Git is by far the winner. And as you become more familiar with Git and how it works and interfaces with your projects you will begin to see why it has risen to the heights of popularity. One of the main benefits of Git is that it keeps a local copy of your work and revisions which you can then edit offline and then once you return to internet source you can sync your copy of the work with all of your new edits and track changes to the main repository online. 
Additionally, since all collaborators on a project have their own local copy of the code, everybody can simultaneously work on their own parts of the code without disturbing that common re repository. Another big benefit that we will definitely be taking advantage of is the ease uh, with which RStudio and Git interface with each other. In the next lesson, we will work on getting Git installed and linked with RStudio and making a GitHub account. So what is GitHub? GitHub is an online interface for Git. Git is software used locally on your computer to record changes. GitHub is a host for your files and the records of the changes made. You can sort of think of it as being similar to Dropbox. The files are on your computer and they are also hosted online and are accessible from any computer. GitHub has the added benefit of interfacing with Git to keep track of all of your file versions and changes. There is a lot of vocabulary involved in working with Git and often the understanding of one word relies on your understanding of a different Git concept. Take some time to familiarize yourself with the words below and read over it a few times to see how the concepts relate. Equivalent to the projects folder or directory, all of your version controlled files and the recorded changes are located in a repository. This is often shortened to repo. Repositories are what are hosted on GitHub and through this interface, you can either uh, keep your repositories private and share them with select collaborators or you can make them public in which anybody can see your files and their history. To comment is to save your edits and the changes made. A comment is like a snapshot of your files. Git compares the previous version of all of your files in the repo to the current version and identifies those that have changed uh, since then. Those that have not changed, it maintains that previously stored file untouched. Those that have changed, it compares the files, logs the changes and uploads the new version of your file. We will touch on this in the next section, but when you commit a file, typically you accompany that file change with a little note about what you changed and why. When we talk about version control systems, commits are at the heart of them. If you find a mistake, you revert your files to a previous commit. If you want to see what has changed in a file over time, you compare the commits and look at the messages to see why and who. Push is to update the repository with your edits. Since Git involves making changes locally, you need to be able to share your changes with the common online repository. Pushing is sending those committed changes to that repository. So now everybody has access to your edits. Pull is to update your local version of the repository to the current version. Since others may have edited in the meanwhile, because the shared repository is hosted online and any of your collaborators or even yourself on a different computer could have made changes to the files and then pushed them to the shared repository, you are behind the times. The files you have locally on your computer may be outdated, so you pull to check if you are up to date with the main repository. The act of preparing a file for a comment, for example, if uh, since your last comment, you have edited three files for completely different reasons. You don't want to comment all of the changes in one go. Your message on why you are making the comment and what has changed will be complicated since three files have been changed for different reasons. So instead you can stage uh, just one of the files and prepare it for commenting. Once you have committed that file, you can stage the second file and commit it and so on. Staging allows you to separate out file changes into separate comments and that is very helpful. To summarize these commonly used terms so far and to test whether you have got the hang of this, files are hosted in a repository that is shared online with collaborators. You pull the repository's contents so that you have a local copy of the files that you can edit. Once you are happy with your changes to a file, you stage the file and then commit it. You push this commit to the shared repository. This uploads your new file and all of the changes and is accompanied by a message explaining what changed and why and by whom. When the same file has two simultaneous copies, when you are working locally and editing a file, you have created a branch where your edits are not shared with the main repository yet. So there are two versions of the file. The version that everybody has access 
to on that repository and your local edited version of the file until you push your changes and merge them back into the main repository you are working on a branch following a branch point the version history splits into two and tracks the independent changes made to both the original file in the repository that others may be editing and tracking your changes on your branch and then merges the files together independent edits of the same file are incorporated into a single unified file independent edits are identified by git and are brought together into a single file with both sets of edits incorporated but you can see a potential problem here if both people made an edit to the same sentence that uh, precludes one of the edits from being possible we have a problem here git recognizes this disparity or conflict and asks for user assistance in picking which edit to keep so conflict is when multiple people make changes to the same file and git is unable to merge the edits you are presented with the option to manually try and merge the edits or to keep one edit over the other clone is to making a copy of an existing git repository if you have just been brought onto a project that has been tracked with version control you would clone the repository to get access to and create a local version of all of the repository's files and all of the track changes what is fork now a personal copy of a repository that you have taken from another person if somebody is working on a cool project and you want to play around with it you can fork their repository and then when you make changes the edits are logged on your repository not theirs it can take some time to get used to working with version control software like git but there are a few things to keep in mind to help establish good habits that will help you out in the future one of those things is to make purposeful commits each commit should only address a single issue this way if you need to identify when you change a certain line of code there is only one place to look to identify the change and you can easily see how to rewrite the code similarly making sure you write informative messages on each commit is a helpful habit to get into if each message is precise in what was being changed anybody can examine the committed file and identify the purpose for your change additionally if you are looking for a specific edit you made in the past you can easily scan through all of your commits to identify those changes related to the desired edit you don't want to get in the same habit that uh, xkcd has finally be cognizant of the version of files you are working on frequently check that you are up to date with the current repo by frequently pulling additionally don't hoard your uh, edited files once you have committed your files and written that helpful message you should push those changes to the common repository if you are done editing a section of code and are planning on moving on to an unrelated problem you need to share that edit with your collaborators hopefully you feel like you have a better handle on how git works than the people in xkcd comic now that we have got a handle on what version control is in this lesson we will sign up for a github account navigate around the github website to become familiar with some of its features and install and configure git all in preparation for linking both with your r studio as we previously learned github is a cloud based management system for your version control files like dropbox your files are both locally on your computer and hosted online and easily accessible its interface allows you to manage version control and provides users with a web based interface for creating projects sharing them updating code etc to get a github account first go to the github website you will be brought to their home page where you should fill in your information make a username put in your email choose a secure password and click sign up for github in this way your account for github will be created and now you can use it you should now be logged in to github in the future to log on to github go to github website where you will be presented with the home page if you are not already logged in click on the sign in link at the top once you have done that you will see the login page where you will enter in your username and password 
that you created earlier. Once logged in, you will be back at GitHub website, but this time the screen should look like this. We are going to take a quick tour of the GitHub website and we will particularly focus on these sections of the interface. User settings, notifications, help files and the GitHub guide. Following this tour, we will make your first repository using the GitHub guide. Now that you have logged on to GitHub, we should fill out some of your profile information and get acquainted with the account settings. In the upper right corner, there is an icon with an arrow beside it. Click this and go to your profile. This is where you control your account from and can view your contribution histories and repositories. Since you are just starting out, you are not uh, going to have any repositories or contributions yet, but hopefully we will change that soon enough. What we can do right now is edit your profile. Go to edit profile along the left hand edge of the page. Here take some time and fill out your name and a little description of yourself in the bio box. And if you like upload a picture of yourself, when you are done click update profile. Along the left hand side of this page, there are many options for you to explore. Click through each of these menus to get familiar with the options available to you. To get you started, go to the account page. Here you can edit your password or if you are unhappy with your username, change it. Be careful though. There can be unintended consequences when you change your username. If you are just starting out and don't have any content yet, you will probably be safe though. Continue looking through the personal setting account on your own. When you are done, go back to your profile. Once you have had a bit more experience with GitHub, you will eventually end up with some repositories to your name. To find those, click on the repositories link on your profile. For now, it will probably look like this. By the end of the lecture though, check back to this page to find uh, your newly created repository. Next, we will check out the notifications menu. Along the menu bar across the top of your window, there is a bell icon representing your notifications. Click on the bell. Once you become more active on GitHub and are collaborating with others, here is where you can find messages and notifications for all the repositories, teams and conversations you are part of. Along the bottom of every single page, there is a help button. GitHub has a great help system in place. If you ever have a question about GitHub, this should be your first point to search. Take some time now and look through the various help files and see if anyone catch your eye. GitHub recognizes that this can be an overwhelming process for new users and as such have developed a mini tutorial to get you started with GitHub. Go through this guide now and create your first repository. When you are done, you should have a repository that looks something like this. Take some time to explore around the repository. Check out your comment history so far. Here you can find all of the changes that have been made to the repository and you can see who made the change, when they made the change and provided you wrote an appropriate comment message. You can see why they made the change. It should look like similar to this. Once you have explored all of the options in the repository, go back to your user profile. It should look a little different from before. Now when you are on your profile, you can see your latest repository created and for a complete listing of your repositories, click on the repositories tab. Here you can see all of your repositories, a brief description, the time of the last edit and along the right hand side, there is an activity graph showing when and how many edits have been made on the repository. Now, as you may remember from our last lecture, Git is the free and open source version control system which GitHub is built on. One of the main benefits of using the Git system is its compatibility with RStudio. However, in order to link the two software together, we first need to download and install Git on your computer. To download Git, go to Git's website. You should arrive at the web page like this. Link will be provided in the blog post. Click on the appropriate download link for your operating system. This should initiate the download process. Once the download is finished, open the .exe file to initiate the installation wizard. If you receive a security warning, click run and or allow. Following this, click through the installation wizard, generally accepting the default options unless you have a compelling reason not to. 
Click install and allow the wizard to complete the installation process. Following this, check the launch uh, git bash option and unless you are curious, deselect the view uh, release notes box as you are probably not interested in this right now. Doing so, a command line environment will open provided you accepted the default options during the installation process. There will now be a start menu shortcut to launch git bash in the future. You have now installed git. Now we will walk you through the most common installation process. However, there are multi ways to uh, get git onto your Mac. You can follow the tutorials at uh, Atlassian git tutorials for alternative installation routes. Link will be provided for this in our blog post. After downloading the appropriate git version for Macs, you should have downloaded a DMG file for installation on your Mac. Open this file. This will install git on your computer. A new window will open. Double click on the .pkg file and an installation wizard will open. Click through the options accepting the defaults. Click install. When prompted, close the installation wizard. You have successfully installed git. Now that git is installed, we need to configure it for use with GitHub in preparation for linking it with RStudio. We need to tell git what your username and email are so that it knows how to name each commit as coming from you. To do so in the command prompt, either git bash for Windows or terminal for Mac, type git config double dash global space user dot name and in commas your username. Just like in slides with your desired username in place of uh, John Doe. This is the name each comment will be tagged with. Following this in the command prompt type git config space double dash global space user dot email. And now make sure to use the same email address you signed up with for github. At this point you should be set for the next step. But just to check confirm your changes by typing git space config space double dash list. Doing so, you should see the username and email you selected above. If you noticed any problems or want to change these values, just retype the original config commands from earlier with your desired changes. Once you are satisfied that your username and email is correct, exit the command line by typing exit and hit enter. At this point, you are all set up for the next lecture. Now that we have both RStudio and Git set up on your computer and a GitHub account, it's time to link them together so that you can maximize the benefits of using RStudio in your version control pipelines. First, we will link RStudio and Git and then we will link RStudio and GitHub. We will also link an existing project with Git and GitHub. Let's start with linking RStudio and Git. In RStudio, go to Tools and then select Global Options. When new screen will show, select git or svn. Sometimes the default path to the git executable is not correct. Confirm that git.exe resides in the directory that RStudio has specified. If not, change the directory to the correct path. Otherwise, click OK or apply. RStudio and git are now linked. Now let's link RStudio and GitHub. In that same RStudio option window, click create RSA key. And when this completes, click close. Following this in that same window again, click view public key and copy the string of numbers and letters. Close this window now. You have now created a key that is specific to you, which we will provide to GitHub so that it knows who you are when you commit a change from within RStudio. To do so, go to github.com, log in if you are not already and go to your account settings. There, uh, go to SSH or GPG keys and click new SSH key. Paste in the public key you have copied from RStudio into the key box and give it a title related to RStudio. Confirm the addition of the key with your GitHub password. GitHub and RStudio are now linked. From here, we can create a repository on GitHub and link to RStudio. On GitHub, create a new repository from your profile to repositories to the new repository. Name your new test repository and give it a short description. Click create repository. Copy the URL from the new repository now. In RStudio, go to the file. Click new project. Select version control. Select git as your version control software. Paste in the repository URL from before. 
Select the location where you would like the project stored. When done, click on create project. Doing so uh, will initialize a new project linked to the GitHub repository and open a new session of RStudio. Now create a new R script. Go to the file menu and then new file and then R script and copy and paste the following code which is two print functions with the text of this file was created within RStudio and, and now it lives on GitHub. Save the file. Note that when you do so, the, the default location for the file is within the new project directory you created earlier. Once that is done, looking back at RStudio, in the Git tab of the environment quadrant, you should see your file you just created. Click the checkbox under staged to stage your file. Click comment. A new window sh should open that lists all of the changed files from earlier and below that shows the differences in the staged files from previous versions. In the upper quadrant in the comment message box, write yourself a comment message, click comment and then close the window. So far you have created a file, saved it, staged it and commented it. Issue Remember your version control lecture. The next step is to push your changes to your online repository. Push your changes to the GitHub repository. Go to your GitHub repository and see that the comment has been recorded. You have just successfully pushed your first comment from within RStudio to GitHub. Till now we linked RStudio with Git and GitHub. In doing this, we created a repository on GitHub and linked it to the RStudio. Sometimes, however, you may already have an R project that is not yet under version control or linked with GitHub. Let's fix that. So, what if you already have an R project that you have been working on but don't have it linked up to any version control software? Ta -ta -ta. Thankfully, RStudio and GitHub recognize this can happen and have steps in place to help you. Admittedly, this is slightly more troublesome to do than just creating a repository on GitHub and linking it with RStudio before starting the project. So first, let's set up a situation where we have a local project that is not under version control. Go to the file menu, then select new project and then select new directory and then select new project and name your project. Since we are trying to emulate a time where you have a project not currently under version control, do not click create a git repository, click create project. We have now created an R project that is not currently under version control. Let's fix that. First, let's set it up to interact with git. Open git bash or terminal and navigate to the directory containing your project files. Move around directories by typing cd command uh, with directory name of path to file. When the command prompt in the line before the dollar sign says the correct directory location of your project, you are in the correct location. Once here, type git uh, init followed by git add. This initializes this directory as a git repository and adds all of the files in the directory to your local repository. Commit these changes to the git repository using git commit minus m initial commit. So at this point we have created an R project and have now linked it to the git version control. The next step is to link this with github. To do this go to github.com and again create a new repository. Make sure the name is the exact same as your R project. Do not initialize a readme file or git ignore or license. Upon creating the repository, you should see a page like this. You should see that there is an option to push an existing repository from the command line with the instructions below containing code on how to do so. In git bash or terminal, copy and paste these lines of code to link your repository with github. After doing so, Refresh your github page and it should now look something like the image on the slide. When you reopen your project in RStudio, you should now have access to the git tab in the upper right quadrant and can push to github. From within RStudio, any future changes. If there is an existing project that others are working on that you are asked to contribute to, you can link the existing project with your RStudio. It follows the exact same premise where you created a github repository and then cloned it to your computer using RStudio. In brief, in RStudio go to the file menu and then select new project and then select version control. Now select git as your version control system and like in the last lesson provide the URL to the repository that you are attempting to clone. 
and select a location on your computer to store the files locally. Create the project now. All the existing files in the repository should now be stored locally on your computer and you have the ability to push edits from your RStudio interface. The only difference from the previous linking is that you did not create the original repository. Instead, you cloned somebody else's. Congratulations everyone. You have made it through the first course in our data science specialization series. Give yourself a pat on the back. See you in the next course which is about R programming and please subscribe our channel so you don't miss on latest updates.